Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome everyone that uh, is coming in. We, I see we have uh, our um, uh, political offices are represented. We have our uh, city uh, uh, mayor, uh, council members. Uh, we have people from various uh, cultural groups. And uh, we have uh, members of the, the TIB, as well as drummers that will be uh, starting us off in a few minutes. Uh, the first thing I want to do is, is welcome the uh, uh, Syrian Canadian Council uh, members and, uh, and anyone that is uh, coming in from uh, a variety of different offices. I'm we have one of our board members has actually uh, made it down today. Most of our board at uh, Kamloops Caribou Regional Immigrant Society is uh, a working group and so they are uh, very busy at this time of the year. But we have Wally Klubeck who is the uh, Vice President of the Board, and uh, Wally will answer any questions uh, that you might have about our society's function and okay, role. So I'd like to acknowledge as well that uh, funding for this event has been provided by the Community Gaming Grant, uh, the province of British Columbia, and uh, it is a, um, a wonderful uh, um, support that we have for our diversity program here in Kamloops. Uh, We'll start us off with uh, the um, introducing uh, Viola Thomas. She's a member of the uh, TIB Council, as well as uh, George uh, Patel, who's the Chief Executive Officer. Uh, I'd like to maybe introduce you at this point, please. Why, why, Kukstrom, Kukstrom, to the people for inviting us. We're absolutely thrilled and honored that you follow the protocol of this territory and in inviting the first peoples of our beautiful land. On behalf of our chief and council and the members of our community, we are grateful that you honor us to invite us to share with you the welcoming of the refugees. We have incredible similar experiences to refugee people in our own homeland. We understand and appreciate and relate to cultural displacement. We understand and relate to the incredible diversity of culture and the beauty and the diversity of culture. We understand and we relate to the beauty and the diversity of the foods that nurture us through our diverse traditions of the human family. So today I want to share with you a little glimpse of our territory, the culture of our people, so that when you welcome the Syrian refugees you can share with them the truth of the First Peoples of this territory. So I say Kukschem once again, and this will be a short seven minute clip. And at the end, I will offer some closing remarks. My name is Shane Godfordson. I'm the 12th elected chief of the Kamloops Indian Band. Welcome to our territory. For thousands of years, the Tecumlupsum 
the people of the Meeting of the Rivers have inhabited the magnificent glacial valleys and mountains of British Columbia's southern interior, Shuswap Territory, Shekwepmek Ulu. Tecumloops, or Kamloops, has always occupied a place of great economic importance for the region. Traversed by two major waterways, the traditional Tecumloopsum territory has been the center of major traffic and trade routes throughout history. Today, the Kamloops Indian Band is an ancient civilization managing contemporary issues through progressive, effective governance. The Kamloops decision-making process is community-based. In accordance with the Kamloops Custom Election Regulations, a general election is held every three years to select one chief and seven councillors who guide the community's direction and interests. All those in favour? The chief and council and the band administration are committed to maximizing opportunities for enhanced social and economic development to provide membership with a culturally strong, healthy and self-sufficient community. The band has envisioned a strategic business model, an innovative process of progressive infrastructure development to improve service delivery as well as to create and enhance business initiatives, partnerships, technology upgrades, employment opportunities and capacity building. Over 70% of the nearly 200 employees of the administration are band members, choosing to serve their community and share their skills and experience in a concentrated effort to achieve a debt-free organization with a clear path to financial self-sustainability and environmental stewardship. The Kamloops Indian Band manages a broad range of services for community members, including social development programs, income assistance, homemaking and care for the elderly and disabled, health programs, community wellness programs, as well as activities for the treasured elders and veterans. Housing initiatives maintain reserve housing and provide capital to build new homes, empowering band members to become homeowners and partners in the housing programs. A state-of-the-art water treatment facility provides band members with excellent quality drinking water, and a modern sewer system serving the entire reserve is due to commence construction shortly. Education is a priority for the Kamloops community as the fundamental key to continued survival and growth. From preschool to adult, the Kamloops Indian Band provides a variety of educational services on and off reserve for its students. The Skelep School of Excellence provides high academic standards balanced with traditional Shekwepma culture in a healthy, safe environment for students from kindergarten to grade 7. Today, the Kamloops District remains at the top of its class with the highest percentage of First Nations high school graduates for the province. In addition, Kamloops Indian Band has forged strong and progressive partnerships with both the Thompson Rivers University and Simon Fraser University. Throughout history, the Tecumloopsum have pledged to uphold and promote Shekwepma culture, tradition, ceremony and language, and to protect and value the land over which it has been granted stewardship. As one of its primary goals, the Kamloops Indian Band is strenuously pursuing the repatriation of its original reserve lands of 136,000 acres or 212 square miles, identified and granted by Governor James Douglas in 1859. In 1864, the Kamloops Reserve was reduced from those 136,000 acres to its present size of 33,000 acres. For over 140 years, the Tecumloopsum have sought to have their land repatriated and their rights and title recognized. To this end, the band established the Douglas Reserve Initiative to pursue the resolution of its land claim through negotiation rather than litigation. After its first claim was rejected, the band discovered new evidence and resubmitted its claim in November 2007. The Kamloops Indian Band has been a pioneer in negotiation and resolution throughout its history. Kamloops is not involved in the BC Treaty process, however, it has actively engaged with the province in the New Relationship Initiative and other discussions associated with land and resource use within asserted traditional territories. A negotiating team has been established by the band to address the land use referral process as well as relationships and partnerships in a positive, non-confrontational and non-litigious manner. This business-like approach has proved to be extremely successful, with agreements being reached with neighboring bands, governments, industry, and third-party interests. These include resource and revenue sharing agreements, land-for-land -land exchanges, and financial settlements in which the Kamloops Indian Band's Aboriginal title and rights have been recognized and preserved, and some Douglas Reserve land repatriated.
It's a great privilege to be able to, to uh, share with you today bits and pieces of our, our history and that we're still resilient, still surviving strong and well today. Even though we have challenges with the continued colonial relationship of this country of ours, but it will be the re resilience of our culture and renewal of our languages that will build a strong foundation for our future children. So Cook's Jim very much for inviting us and have a great day. And Thank you very much. And um, a welcoming and an opening usually involves uh, a song. And so we have the Kamloops uh, uh, Aboriginal Friendship Center uh, drummers and I've asked them if they could um, start with a, uh, a welcoming song, please. We would like to sing you guys an honor song, which is from uh, this area. So when we sing the honor song in the traditional territory of the Sohuapan people, we have to uh, acknowledge by uh, standing up. And we, we honor the culture that is from here, and we honor the territory, we honor the waters, the mountains, and we honor uh, the culture that has been here for a long, long, long time. And this is the Sopapam Honor Song. And we honor the guests. Yeah, and we honor the guests. Thank you very much. At this point in time, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Mayor Peter Milibar of the uh, city of Kamloops. Just perfect, Mayor Paul, as always. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or I guess it's still a little bit morning, I guess we'll call it. Uh, but I, I do want to say thank you all for coming and Paul for organizing this today. Uh, we have several councillors here as well. Councillor Donovan Cavers, Mark Spina is here, Arjun Singh, I believe. Uh, but I just want to say uh, thank you again for all of you in this room for, for investing your time, uh, not just today, but what will undoubtedly be a, an interesting journey for all of us over the next uh, year and a half or so. Uh, certainly, we have a lot of experience in the community welcoming refugees in the Schwepmik territory that we uh, all call home has always been very welcoming to, to people wanting to, to settle and start a new life. Um, but this is a little bit different of a scenario this time because normally the government uh, sponsored refugees all get settled in the, the Metro Vancouver area, the ones that come to British Columbia from various parts of the world. And it's a, it's a little bit new for Kamloops in terms of not just the numbers uh, in any one in, intake, but also uh, the combination of the, the sponsored versus the, the government uh, sponsored uh, refugees that are coming. And certainly uh, myself and uh, Ministers Lake and Stone and uh, MP McLeod have had a few meetings already with, with Paul and, and uh, the United Way and RAFT and, and the school district now is involved and IHA, uh, trying to make sure we're all on the same page and understanding what, what each of us can bring to the table because um, the reality is not one agency is going to be able to do this on their own. And uh, there's, there's no way, uh, and I don't think anyone would want uh, a, just a government kind of policy book to be the, the guiding document because, uh, you know, the, the reality is to make a, a truly su successful transition for the refugees and for them to feel like they're truly ingrained into the community, it's going to take all of you in the community 
to be engaged with them. Certainly on the government side, we'll support as best we can, but uh, ultimately it's going to be that uh, interaction within the community and feeling welcome that's going to truly make it a successful uh, a landing spot for the refugees and, and we would hope that they would want to continue on living in Camels in the area uh, for much more than the first year that uh, of the program. And in Camels we're very fortunate with TRU and, and such a, a diverse uh, TRU world uh, uh, student body that we have for a city our size. Uh, we definitely have I think a lot more understanding around the different cultures around the world and, and uh, accepting of those as well. And so I have every confidence that it's going to be a very successful transition for the refugees as they arrive. And again, I want to thank all of you uh, on behalf of all of Council for investing your time, not just today, but over the next year and a half uh, or so to make sure that these people fleeing uh, very uh, uh, horrific circumstances have the best chance of uh, really integrating and feeling part of uh, our Camelot's community because it is a very welcoming and diverse community we all live in and I think we want to make sure that shines through. So uh, thanks again everyone and uh, hopefully today's uh, very productive for everyone. I also want to acknowledge some of the other uh, uh, multicultural uh, society members and um, cultural groups that are here at this time. There's, we know that the Kamloops Multicultural Society has members in the room. Uh, the Gurdwaras, I want to thank the, uh, the presidents and the, uh, the leadership of the Gurdwaras for uh, coming in and visiting as well. Um, we have uh, the RAF team. We have uh, a number of uh, different people from the schools, and uh, we uh, expect a, a fairly substantial group of students coming in this afternoon as well. So we'll probably be operating down here as well as up in the classrooms on the, uh, on the TV monitors up there. Um, me. Uh, one of the things that I didn't, uh, I failed to mention is uh, I'm of Métis origin. I, I come from a little place in New Brunswick and uh, of mixed blood with the uh, Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet, as well as some, some French in the background there too. And so um, I am very familiar with um, racial issues and how it can sometimes be difficult to convince someone that uh, is critical of, of your background or my background. And uh, very often these things are based in fear. And so today's gathering is to try to address some of the issues that might be of concern, not just to residents, but to the newcomers as well. And that's one of the reasons why we, we opened with uh, First Nations uh, presentation and, and introduction as well as a welcoming, because this is how it really uh, starts in terms of uh, opening the doors is you welcome uh, the people coming in. And so our hope is that this information that you hear today will be of support. And again, I would encourage you to ask questions of the, uh, the members that are presenting or of any one of us that, uh, that can certainly provide you with, uh, with some, uh, some support. Without further ado, I believe uh, at this point, uh, it is time to introduce the Syrian uh, Canadian Council members of, uh, of British Columbia. Uh, we have uh, President uh, um, Nader um, Abdullah, and uh, we have Rahim Othman, spokesperson uh, for this uh, presentation. <laughs> Questions? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to stand in front of you and would like to extend my sincere uh, uh, thanks to the organizers, to the uh, uh, sponsors and community uh, partners. Uh, it's great to uh, see such a large number of people here. Your presence will make this event more meaningful and kindles the flame of hopes that Syrians are looking for. The hope that other humans will understand their suffering and stand by their side in their major ordeal. Syrians didn't breathe suffering for nearly five years. But in the middle of deadly winter, surrounded by fierce ogres, Syrians were futureless, but now are hopeless. Syrians demonstrations began in March 2011, but the peaceful protests quickly escalated after the government's violence cracked down, and rebels began fighting back against the regime. In 2013, of the unknown, 
ISIS has appeared, invading and besieging cities, killing free army members, and sharing the regime, their mission to eliminate the last breath of the revolution. Four years into bloody war, the revolution has been all but forgotten by the international community. The deaths of over 250,000 men, women, and children seemingly have been eclipsed by murky politics and an obsessive focus on the Islamic State. While the Syria regime continues to drop devastating barrel bombs on civilians and run torture prisons, ISIS consumes the media, but the Assad regime's barrel bombs are treated as the norm. It's not normal or acceptable for any government in the world to deploy an air force to extensively bomb its own people. But the world has decided to turn a blind eye to this crushing daily brutality and has left the Syrian people to suffer under two terrors, the Assad regime and ISIS militias. For Syrians, everyday decision, whether to visit a neighbor, to go out to buy bread, have become potentially decision about life and death. It takes three seconds to say 200,000 people have died in Syria, but it will take 40 days to tweet half their names, five days to read their names. Syria's war is the worst humanitarian crisis of our time. Half the country's pre-war population, more than 100 million, uh, more than 11 million people have been killed, detained, or forced to flee their homes. Families are struggling to survive inside Syria or make a new home in neighboring countries. Others are risking their lives on the way to Europe, hoping to find acceptance and opportunities. They are fleeing unimaginable horrors, the horrors of war, bombs, snipers, and hunger. And they are people just like you and me. They are fathers and mothers and children. They have to leave everything to unknown, their homes, their safety, and have to walk across countries' borders, along motorways, down roads to parks, leading to beaches and to the sea and to the boats. There is a poem by Warshanshire. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. You have to understand that no, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one leaves home until home is a sweetie voice, voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. Syria is not, is not a story of refugees. It's a story of disheartened people, a story of a failing world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nader, for this uh, introduction, touchy introduction. And uh, I would like also to thank everybody uh, here um, for being present on this day. I was told that you received much of the snow just last night and the roads were slippery. So I appreciate the effort that you made to, to come over here. Uh, probably some of you or maybe many of you, uh, many of you came from uh, maybe longer distances than 
um, uh, what we see on average in back in Vancouver. So I appreciate that. Um, so what we listened to the introduction, and I think what I'm going to be trying to do now is to give a very um, high level uh, introduction about Syria, starting from its history all the way to what's happening for the last few years and, uh, and the, the culture uh, the, and the migration that we would expect to see uh, that is coming to uh, Canada from Syria. So it's not, I'm not intending to really give an information session. It's more of, of a, a very high level. I'm not going to spend like the entire time. I think there was uh, almost an hour assigned for the slot. I'll try and, and go as, you know, as reasonably fast as possible to give you enough ideas. And then at the end, the rest of the hour would leave it to your questions, which I would really, really encourage you to ask difficult questions. Don't ask me easy questions. <laughs> I know we have a lot of people have concerns. A lot of people have uh, uh, heard of issues, um, uh, of challenges. Uh, so we'd like to hear about them, and we'd like to discuss it here, so that you can also spread the word. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be your question, but it could be a question that you've heard from somebody else, or from a media outlet, or wherever. So we're here to kind of share uh, the knowledge and educate ourselves and and help raising the awareness. So um, I'm uh, typically I'm more of a moving like Italian style person, but <laughs> since the microphone is fixed, I'm gonna try and fix myself. Fine, I'm okay, fine. So Syria is located in Asia. Um, some people don't know that it's located in the southwest side of Asia, uh, very close to Europe, uh, very close to Africa as well. So it's in the heart of the what some people call the old world. Um, it is the land of very, very, very old civilization. Um, in Syria, contrary to what a lot of people think, has four seasons, which means we have a very... <laughs> uh oh Yeah, back, 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 back. All right, here we go. Thank you for that. <laughs> I didn't mean to go that fast. Um, so, uh, so we have four seasons, which means we have a very cold winter. Uh, as a matter of fact, nowadays it's as cold as Kamloops, definitely colder than what we have in Vancouver. Um, and we have a quite warm, hot summer, and uh, of course we have the fall and the spring. Um, so, moving to the next slide here, as I said earlier, uh, history in Syria goes way, way back. Uh, in time. Um, so Syria has um, um, a lot of old cities or many old cities. There are six locations in Syria uh, already on the UNESCO World Heritage list and 12 more on the tentative list. Um, beside what you see on the screen, Damascus, which is the current capital of Syria, is actually the oldest known capital. Um, Aleppo, which is the second biggest city in Syria, is basically the oldest continuously inhabited city. Uh, and we have um, other old cities like the uh, Palmyra, Bosra, so forth, so forth. Um, as, uh, and also, um, there were two Syrian emperors of Rome. Um, so towards the end of uh, Rome's first millennium, um, two Syrian youths, uh, re uh, regained the in succession as uh, Roman emperors. Um, some of uh, this is Ugarit. It's one of the cities. is now called Latakia. Um, there, uh, found the oldest and first written alphabet in the world uh, was developed there around 1400 BC. I'm not going to go through all the information. Um, this is Palmyra. Uh, it's probably, I don't know if some of you saw it in the news, it's one of the very oldest cities. Unfortunately, uh, when ISIS uh, gained a control on the city, they destroyed a lot of history over there. So that's another part of the devastating fact that we're living in. Uh, Palmyra, which uh, uh, I just mentioned. Okay. So Malula, Malula is also one of the oldest cities 
in the world, it, uh, it means in Aramic entrance. The people over there speak the Aramic language, which is actually the language of Jesus. Not very many people in the world speak that language. They still speak it, and they teach it to their kids, and they still preserve it. Okay, my cheat sheets are getting out of order. <laughs> Ethnic diversity. So, you can imagine, uh, for a place that goes way, way back in history, for a place that sits in the heart of the world, you can imagine the diversity. I was watching the video about Kamloops before we, get, we got started, and uh, we're talking about 200 years, and we see such an amazing diversity in Kamloops. The population in Kamloops started around 18, um, 1850 with about 500 people. Now we're talking about 100,000 more or less, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, they came from all over the world. Um, so you can imagine for a place like Syria who goes back centuries, thousands of years, will have such a great uh, diversity. Although uh, the Arab forms the majority of the ethnic uh, of, of the population, uh, there are other ethnic groups, uh, Kurds, uh, Turkmen, um, uh, Armenians, and others. <coughs> Uh, so one thing to mention also, Syria has been the, um, the target of a lot of refugees throughout history. Um, for example, uh, refugees fleeing from the massacres of Russia and Turkey in the, 18, in the 19th and the 20th centuries. Um, so, and it, so it was well known uh, for receiving refugees with open arms. Uh, these ethnic uh, uh, groups have lived side by side uh, for thousands of years uh, with, with peace. Um, not denying that there were conflicts. Conflicts are always there, but they are the exception, not the norm. Uh, that comes with the religion diversity. Um, so although Islam is probably the biggest uh, religion uh, with about 75% uh, uh, representation, uh, there's Christian, we used to have uh, quite a bit of Jews. As a matter of fact, there used to be about 40,000 uh, Jewish uh, people in Syria just before the establishment of Israel. A lot of them left to Israel, but their neighborhoods and their homes are still there, locked and protected uh, by uh, the, uh, the regime or the, uh, uh, the system over there. Um, there are also we have, uh, there is a lot of Christians uh, that includes the Greek Orthodox, uh, Catholic, uh, Malkite, uh, Syriac Catholic, Armenian Catholic, Maronite, and more. Uh, even, the, uh, even on the most Islam uh, side of it, uh, the majority of the 75% is Sunni Muslims, but there are other smaller groups like Druze, Ismaili, uh, Shiite and so forth. So you can see it's it's like a, 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 a big blend of uh, races, a big blend of religions as well. Okay, uh, this is also a very high level of how the society looks like in Syria. So I mean, in general, people are educated. Uh, it's in the culture to encourage education, not only to high school, but even to post high school parents typically push their kids to kind of gain at least uh, a bachelor degree uh, somewhere. Um, a lot of people target to, uh, to be doctors or engineers, and that's where the highest marks from high school go to university. Um, a lot of young people, uh, as I mentioned, uh, or I tried to hint, it's family-centered, so it's, it's more uh, an orient type of uh, a culture, and obviously, religion tolerance. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, from Syria, there were influential people who came uh, from Syria. I, would, I wouldn't go through uh, the whole list, but I can mention Steve Jobs. We all know Steve Jobs, who came from a Syrian father, uh, who was born in Homs. Um, and most recently, Jihad Abdo or Jay Abdo, 
who is now a Hollywood actor. He actually participated in the Queen of Desert with Nicole Kidman. Uh, you probably can uh, look him up. <laughs> All right, so this is about Syria, and I think enough about Syria. Um, as I said, again, I'm not here to give all the information. I actually, one of my objectives here, not uh, to create more questions in your heads, uh, so that when you go back home, uh, if you decide to, to look for information that would relate more to you and relate to the awareness of yourself and the people around you. So we're moving now to uh, Syrian in Canada. So Syrian came in Canada in, in two waves. The first one was uh, between 1885 and 1908, and the second one was from 1945 to present. Uh, some statistics that you can see here, they were extracted from the census uh, in 2011. Uh, it gives you an idea about how well uh, the Syrian Canadian integrated in the Canadian community. Uh, so you can see here like 48% of Syrian Canadian um, are university graduates compared to 28% in the total population of Canada. Okay. Uh, the rate of females uh, of Syrian origin actually uh, is higher than the rate of all Canadian women, 30%. Uh, labor force of Syrian origin is uh, lower 80% than the rate of the total population of 86%, a little bit lower. Uh, the labor force uh, participating uh, for female uh, basically is, uh, again, a little bit lower, which is um, 82%. Um, employment of Syrian origin, it's 73%, a little bit lower than the total population of 81. Um, for females, it's 60 Four percent, also uh, a little bit uh, less than the uh, total population of 77 percent. And I'd like to mention here, um, the reason I'm focusing on female is because there is this perception that females in that part of the world are not working uh, part of the society. They're mostly like uh, housewives. Uh, these stats you know, can give you an idea that's not exactly accurate. They're probably less than the average, but not really way less than the average. Unemployment rate, uh, again, according to the 2011, it's about 9.1%, a little bit less than the average population of 6.2% 6 with female. It's just 6.1%, so it's very, very close to the male stats we have. Okay, so... We talked about a little bit about Syria history, Syrian Canadian in Canada. What's been happening the last few years? Uh, 2011, uh, in March to be exact, just after the Arab Springs, um, some Syrian people felt it's time to rise up a little bit. Um, for a little bit of background context, before the uprising, Syria has been under dictatorship, a very strong grip dictatorship for over 30 years, started by Hafez al-Assad uh, in 1970, uh, and then followed by his son uh, after that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll just mention, just to give you an example of how uh, dictatorship it was. Uh, the constitution doesn't allow the president to be less than 40 years old. Right after the father passed away, they changed the constitution as literally a few minutes just to fit the 37 years old of his son, and they changed it to 37 years old. <laughs> yeah, you can look it up. Uh, the second example that I can mention about uh, election, uh, sorry, uh, about how dictatorship is, they do elections. They used to win by 99, 999%, sometimes 99, 95, sometimes 99, 1, but it didn't used to go less than 99 until the very, until the very, uh, the very last election, who the, who, which they did uh, a couple of years ago, and I think about 20 some, uh, sorry, 80 percent something. But anyways, on the election, which I experienced myself, uh, I don't know if Nader has, you go to the poll. Um, so you go to the poll. You want to make an election. Uh, they take your ID, similar to here, very civilized, good. Then they keep your ID, they give you the 
the form where you can choose. Uh, there is one candidate, <laughs> not the last one, the before, for Hafez al-Assad, literally one candidate, which is Hafez al-Assad. You have two circles, red circle and a green circle. The green is yes, the red is no. Uh, whether you accept this guy to be a president. So you do fill it up in front of the agent who has your name and information, and then you give it back to them. Obviously, if you vote no, you would probably be disappeared same day or soon after, right? Um, there has been a, a civil conflict in Syria back in the 80s. Um, if you also look it up in the internet, Hama massacre, uh, there was an internal massacre in Hama, which is a central city in Syria. Um, the regime killed a range between 20 to 40,000. I know it's outrageous range because nobody documented this very well. Uh, in the 18, 1982, so they killed between 20 to 40,000. Um, it's a city where I was born. Uh, as a matter of fact, half of the city was literally wiped out from, uh, from existence. So, back, uh, they there was a starting of a peaceful uh, uprising in 2011. The, the, it started with peaceful protests. It's continued for almost a year. Um, and then, I mean, as we can imagine from a, such a dictatorship who, you know, used always force to kind of oppress these kind of things, uh, forced the people to start to defend themselves and use weapons. So militarization of the, com of the uprising started around 2012. Um, and then it started to become more complex. The regime as Nader mentioned, used barrel bombs, uh, and it's really, um, literally, a, a, a barrel filled with TNT and even coins and nails, and they just throw it arbitrarily from uh, airplanes on top of targets. Uh, we can see how accurate those targets are, killing indiscriminately uh, kids, women, and civilians. Um, the regime has even crossed the red line that was drawn to them by not using the chemical weapon, and they used it. Uh, first recorded in, in Ghouta, which is a suburb of Damascus, uh, in August 2013, uh, that killed hundreds uh, of uh, innocent civilian. Many, many of them are kids. Um, if you would like to look it up on YouTube, it's very, very heartening. I myself uh, could not stand it. The, to watch those kids shivering from this chemical effect and impact on them, uh, it's devastating. Um, a conflict that nobody could, res could try to resolve for three years that has a lot of oppression, uh, <clears throat> also created an opportunity for extremists like what we have seen in Iraq. So ISIS, um, started to gain uh, ground in 2013. And that was their rise, and the situation has become more complicated. And Syria became a place of proxy war for so many people, uh, for Russia, for Iran, for Hezbollah, for US, for Saudi Arabia, for Turkey, you name it. Um, talking about ISIS and the regime, we talked about uh, how barbaric the regime is. ISIS is not any less barbaric. Um, as a matter of fact, ISIS, who claims to be the um, Muslim state uh, group, uh, actually killed more Muslims than anybody else. Uh, as a matter of fact, they started their massacres uh, back in 2012, 2013. Uh, they did massacre in their Zor at some point. They killed in one massacre um, about 700 people aged between 15 and 55 years old. Uh, one thing I'd just like to note here is that, unfortunately, we don't know about these things. Unfortunately, we start to realize the danger of something when it hits our doors or it hits our homes. These were happening to these people before it even came to our attention. 
And that's one of the things we need to think a little bit more about. So what happened? Out of the 23 million people of Syrian population, um, we're talking about uh, more than 13 million people displaced from their homes. Uh, 8 million inside the country, 5 million outside the country. So a little bit more than half of the population. This is, by all means, the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. These are not my words. These are the United Nations word, words. Um, this crisis killed over 300,000, many more um, prisoned, many more disappeared. We don't know about. And then th this year, earlier this year, we started to see the refugee waves hitting the doors of Europe. And one of the questions I used to uh, face a lot, why now? I mean, the conflict has been there for five years. Why now they're just fleeing? And that's a good question. Um, the answer is also, again, to what Nader has hinted in his, his introduction. People was, was hoping that this is going to end sometime soon. They were hoping that, you know, it's going to be over and we're going to get back to normal life. But after four or five years, people has literally lost hope. They're not seeing light at the end of the tunnel. And that's why they are putting their children in rubber boats, uh, risking their lives. Because, again, as he hinted, it's safer than staying, looking for future. Um, so this is where we are. Um, the, uh, the, the, the question is, what is the solution? Um, we, are, we are opening our doors and arms to our brothers and sisters in humanity. Uh, it's, uh, we're doing our part uh, by helping and supporting, by accepting more people in our homes, by sending help to them. But what's really the solution? Is that a solution? Uh, the answer to that is no. A lot of people say it's no, and I agree with that. That's not the solution. The solution, we need to, to end that conflict there. We need to end indiscriminate killing. We need to end killing based on race, based on religion, based on ideology belonging. We need to return this country to the peaceful state it used to be for the many thousands of years ago. And that's the only solution. Um, we can imagine that's not a solution in our hands as persons, individuals, not even in groups. Um, it's, it's, it needs uh, actually international uh, uh, work on that. It needs international commitment. Uh, this is an obligation on each one of us to increase awareness, to lobby, uh, to support, to help, to make sure that uh, the unaware are aware and to push our government here in Canada and, and elsewhere uh, to uh, push for a solution. So cultural bridging, I'll let uh, Nader uh, speak uh, about this for the uh, coming few minutes, uh, about what the refugees, uh, the Syrian refugees coming here would expect, what can we do to help them, and then uh, we'll open it up for discussion. And I'm really sorry, I guess I went way over the time I assigned to myself. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so, we received many questions about Syrians. Who are they? Uh, what's your expectation? What's, what's their expectation? So, I, I will go through this. So, you expect to receive two categories. The first category is like skilled uh, uh, workers with the trades but without English, okay? They don't know English, zero English. You will receive well-educated people, graduate, and they know English. They have, um, let's say, level seven or eight English, okay? So both of them, you need, we need to focus on how we can integrate them quickly in the community, and this is very important. So for those who don't know English very well, we need to uh, work on them uh, uh, teach them English within like a very limited period, fast-paced fast uh, English, 
to contribute to the community right away. Syrians are open-minded, business-minded. So when, you, when they know English very well, they can integrate well in, the, in their communities. They don't have any restrictions. They don't have any problem with others. Uh, they don't see, uh, they don't have any even perception about like cultural differences and any other thing. They can integrate well. So no fear of this. Uh, they are moderate. They are not ISIS. Okay. This is very important. Yeah. Because I receive, are they ISIS? No, they are not. They are fleeing ISIS, in fact. And most of them who are going to receive, they are registered with UN before even 2013 before even ISIS came to the picture. picture. So they are 2013 and before. ISIS started 2013 and after. So those guys are moderate and from different background. They are Muslims, practice Islam, or they don't practice Islam, both parties, okay? They are Christians and they are other groups, okay? so. Uh, the most important thing is the English. This is this is our like our like uh, 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 organization, Syrian Canadian Council recommendation to many uh, settlement agencies. I have an experience just last week with two refugees, two families. Both of them came 20 days ago, and both males found a job. They don't speak English. Zero. Nothing. They can't even say hello. Okay. So they found job right away. Of course, they found the job with like someone speaks Arabic, but they eager to work. Some of them, like some some guys said, oh, they are gonna go to welfare and they will stay like around two three years on welfare. Syrians don't do that. And usually, our people like to establish their own businesses. They don't even rely on others on this thing, and this is very important. Uh, uh, through our journey with, with many like uh, refugees who came to Canada like uh, starting last year, uh, most of them, let's say that's in, in Vancouver, Metro Vancouver area, uh, where you see approximately 20 families, 10 of them, they already established their own businesses. Self-employed, of course, you know. So, because they have their own trades, they have their own like uh, skills. So, uh, two things we said: this the um, the English very important for the first category, and the second one is the credential uh, uh, accreditation or recognition, and this is very important. Uh, who has the skills? Uh, we need to work on their. Uh, how can we upgrade their skills? And this is very important. Like, if they are plumbers, so they have to have a certificate. So the certificate is important to practice their uh, uh, trade. Uh, uh, in construction, they may need something. Electrician, all these things are important. Uh, uh, those who has like their uh, education, uh, they need to be guided through the way to find something to do, either to uh, transfer their like uh, maybe uh, credential to another universities, continue study, uh, uh, maybe uh, gain some, um, uh, let's say, designations like uh, project management or anything uh, related to their experience. And what we recommend is to uh, start a kind of uh, initial needs assessment for any refugee so you can understand their basic needs. And uh, there's a disconnection between really uh, what like government uh, provides to, 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 to uh, uh, those refugees and uh, the reality. Because they don't know what to do after they like uh, being like taken to their like places, to their new homes, then they left them without any uh, resources. So they, they want to know what to do. So the basic needs assessment is very important. A screening, like what do you have, what are your skills, uh, your English level, all these things, put them together, and the counselor or any like one can sit with them and recommend some directions, recommendations for them. Okay, and this is very 
important. Uh, connect them to the community is important. How to connect those uh, newcomers to their communities? Emotional support is very important. Uh, 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 we need to figure out like the how it's important to uh, newcomers without English and without like really a real interaction with others uh, is not there. So uh, to connect them to uh, Arabic speakers is very important, even if they are not Syrians. Like in Kamloops, there are no Syrians. So you can connect them to other families is very important. Uh, uh, connect them to their uh, religious maybe uh, places if they have. If they don't have, then uh, they can establish something different. We already discussed some of this. And they can go through this uh, with you. So all these are very important things to uh, deal with. Uh, also, private sponsors are really... Uh, 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 we appreciate their like uh, generosity and their uh, how do they like willing to help Syrians. But we also uh, experience some difficulties to access uh, those newcomers because they uh, uh, really the re the relation is not clear between them and the the, the, the newcomers, uh, and some of them uh, try to exaggerate the relation and to eliminate those newcomers of interaction with other, uh, with resources, with communities, with other things. And these are very important. So basically, this is everything I want to talk about it. So if you have questions, you can ask. Thank you very much. Hello, Sandra from Clearwater. Um, I was just a little bit um, unclear on your last remarks. Um, you were talking about, um, is, 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 yeah, the, the, which, which yes. Uh, well, uh, the, part of the, the sponsorship? Yes, okay. at the very end. Okay, yes. I, 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 will, I will let you know. We have <laughs> okay, so we have experience with this. Now, we, we recognize that private sponsors really, really want to host and serve and uh, welcome those new refugees. But there is a boundaries between, like, extra, like, to uh, be more like, uh, how can I say, protective, protective to them, yeah. and and this is this will will uh, 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 will break the relation between both parties, and sometimes will like uh, eliminate those newcomers of accessing like their community resources, their like people, other resources because okay, we have a plan for them. That's good. You have a plan for them. But when they interact with their communities, it's very important to let them do that because this is their community. This is their people. Okay? And this is very important. Like you don't deal with those people as uh, strangers, for example. And you don't need to like have an appointment uh, like paper for them and you deal with them like you are the secretary or you are who organize everything for them. And this is important. We face this lately, like just one, one week ago. And because I, I, I understand many of them really like new to this thing and they want to, they are overwhelmed and would like to show more like warm coming and but sometimes destroy the relation between them and Important others. To them as well. I also want to thank Mastermind Studios for coming in and supporting us in terms of how we're presenting today and having access to doing the, the television viewing from upstairs. Uh, that's excellent. I also want to thank our staff. You know, if it wasn't for Kobe and, uh, and uh, Graham, this diversity event would probably not have materialized as well as it has. So I really appreciate that. I want to thank everyone as well. And I'd also like to not forget, let's not forget, as well as Mastermind Studios, we have GK Sound doing all of our sound equipment. Thank you very much. Thank you.